You look beautiful and handsome. It is wonderful to see our Unity Center family here gathered tonight for our Christmas Eve candlelighting service, to see some of you that I know have traveled far to be with your families, and yet you are here with them here in our beautiful Unity Center community. If you've never been here before, a very warm and special welcome to you. My name is Wendy Craig Purcell. I am the minister here at the Unity Center. Can I see by a show of hands who's here for the very first time? You've never been with us before. A special welcome to you. Very special welcome to you. Very special welcome to you. If you do live in San Diego and are here for the first time, I want to invite you to come back on another Sunday and just check us out on a Sunday morning. Our services are at 9 and 11. And just experience some of what unity is all about. Those of us who have found unity have usually come from another spiritual tradition, and we wind up here because something didn't quite fit for us anymore. We wind up here because we feel spiritually that we want to learn and stretch and grow, and we want to find a teaching that makes sense to our mind and our heart and our soul, and we want to find a community or a tribe that we can connect with and learn and grow and practice with. So I invite those of you who've not been here before to check Unity out, whether here in San Diego with us or wherever you call home. I also want to say how great it is to see so many of you here that I know have such busy and full lives that you still look at the Unity Center as your spiritual home and community. And just know that even though maybe we don't get to see each other as often as we would like or would want to, that my heart is really with you and that together we are growing and evolving as spiritual beings. And we will always be here for you. So I wanna say to all of you, welcome home. Welcome home. And I want to remind you of next Sunday. Next Sunday is also one of our favorite services that we do. Every year at the end of the year, we do a very special, unique unity service called our Burning Bowl White Stone Ceremony. How many of you have never been to our Burning Bowl White Stone Ceremony? Can I see by a show of hands? Don't be shy, I'm not gonna ask you to do anything other than let me know if you've not been here, because then I know whether to explain it a little bit. So it sounds like a strange name, doesn't it? Burning bowl, white stone, what, what is that all about? Well, in unity, in our spiritual practice, we know the importance of letting go of the old and making room for the new. And we have not too many, but a few rituals and traditions in unity, and one of them is our burning bowl white stone ceremony. And in our burning bowl ceremony, we come together and we're in prayer and meditation and reflection together as we think about the things that happen during the year that we don't want to carry forward in the new year. Does anybody have anything like that? Yeah, it's, it's a wild part and a fun part of our service. And so we do some meditation around that. We write down about those things that we want to let go of. And then we literally go outside to our beautiful patio and we burn those pieces of paper. And the energy when we come back in this room is so alive and so open and so much fun. And then we spend some time together thinking about and opening up to what is it that we want in the new year? And what is it going to take for that to happen for us? And so we do a little bit of visioning together for the new year. And then the white stone part has to do with physically a stone that we give you. And in meditation and prayer, we receive a guiding word or practice that we're going to use throughout the year to help us fulfill those dreams and visions and goals. So if you've not been to one of those services before, let me especially invite you next Sunday, our different time, 10 o'clock only, one service only. So if you come at nine, you can help us set up. <laughs> and if you come at 11, you'll miss half of it. So you'll wanna come at 10 o'clock next Sunday. So that's all I wanted to share with you to just welcome you back home and to give you not only the gift of this evening, but also the gift of our service next week. So let me invite to the platform now, Phil Dietz, who's going to share the Christmas story out of the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew. 
starting with the Gospel of Luke. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to him to be married and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. And Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds had returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. And from the Gospel of Matthew... After Jesus was born, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem, and they asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Herod the king called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. After they had heard the king, the Magi went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose ahead of them until it stopped over a place where the child was. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. So what wonderful energy for us to move into a time of prayer and meditation together right now. So I invite you to just take a moment to close your eyes and to sit back in your chair, allowing the chair to support you. And and as you close your eyes to begin to center into the quietness, the stillness, the peace within. being aware of each precious breath as it enters your body and being aware of each precious breath as you let it go. Allowing the mind to become a bit more quiet and still and allowing your attention to move into the area of the heart. Imagine each mindful breath moving through your heart as you bring the experience of the heart into our time together this evening.
Our teacher and we show her Jesus of Christ told us that when we pray, we were to pray to the Father within who, who hears us and knows us and sees us in that inner stillness, in that silence. We were to pray in secret, that we were to shut the door and to enter in. And oh, how we know that he was not talking about a physical door or a physical room, but was certainly talking about a certain state of mind and heart in which we recognize that we are so much more than our past. We are so much more than the things we have done or the things we own. We're certainly more than our mistakes that we have made that there is within each and every one of us that spark of the divine, and that it is to that that we turn in prayer and meditation, that that might guide us in such a way that we live our lives from a higher truth, a more spiritual truth, that we might be guided to expand in our capacity to love and to forgive and to serve. And so as we are joined together this evening on Christmas Eve and celebration of the birth of a man whose teachings still can change lives one by one. We take a moment to offer up our Christmas prayer. A prayer for our loved ones, our family, our friends. To offer up a prayer for peace and a just world for everyone with no exceptions. And so let us take just a moment in stillness and in silence to send forth that prayer, a prayer of peace, a prayer of love, a prayer of light. And so it is, and so we are, and together we say, Amen. Amen. So if you look in your bulletin, you see that I've entitled the message I want to share with you this evening, A Conspiracy of Love. You know, I love our candle lighting service. There's something absolutely magical to me at the end when the room is dark and we begin the process of lighting the candles and how just one lit candle shared by others can transform a darkened room into absolutely beautiful, warm, glowing, bright light. And you know, we, we do our candle lighting service very much in honor of and in recognition of Jesus' statement of all of us when he said that we are the light of the world and that we were to let our light shine, that we were not to dim it, we were not to hide it, we weren't to put it under a bu bushel, but we were in fact to light it so that the whole world would see. And I think about that each and every Christmas candle lighting service and other times throughout the year as well. Well, how do we let our light shine as bright as it possibly can? We know that the light indwells us, but how do we let that light shine as bright as it possibly can? And I really think it comes down to something very simple to speak about, but something that re really requires that we continue to grow and practice in it, and that is love. If you think about it, when someone is in love, they radiate, don't they? 
their eyes sparkle, there's an energy about them, whether it is the love of a puppy or a kitten, or the love that you feel for your significant other, or the love of looking out at a beautiful sunset or a magical starry sky, there's a twinkling, there's a, there's a radiance of light that comes from within us. We didn't put the light there. All we can do is choose to either let it shine more brightly or to keep it from shining as brightly as, as it can. I came across this statement from Hamilton Wright, maybe as I was preparing this message, and I'd not heard it before this year. Hamilton Wright wrote, blessed is the season which engages the whole world in a conspiracy of love. Conspiracy of love, say that with me. A conspiracy of love. We usually think of conspiracy as something negative. But if, what if every single one of us in this room decided that we were going to work together in a conspiracy of love, wherever we are, with whomever we are sharing time and space with, and I do mean anyone, everywhere, anywhere, if we were to commit ourselves to being in a conspiracy of love. Jesus certainly, he didn't originate a conspiracy of love, but he certainly talked about it a lot, right? Remember when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, the greatest commandment is to love God with all your mind and all your heart and all your soul and to love your neighbor as, not instead of, to love your neighbor as yourself. And he also, toward the end of his teaching ministry, when he sent his disciples out two by two to share his ideas, his message of consciousness, his spiritual teaching, he, he said, everybody will know that you belong to me, that you are mine by how well you love one another. Not how well you quote me, not how many people you convert, but by how well you love one another. It is in loving that our light shines brighter and brighter. You know, in Christianity, there is a tendency to forget some very important things. And one of the important things that I think sometimes gets lost or forgotten in Christianity is that before there were worshipers of Jesus, there were followers of Jesus. And if, you've, if you have been in metaphysics for any length of time, you know that it's far easier to worship than it is to follow. To follow means that we are choosing to live our lives in a very particular kind of way in relationship to one another, which is really fundamentally in a relationship of oneness to one another, in a relationship of inclusion to one another, in a relationship of love to one another. What is also often forgotten is that long before there were places called churches with creeds and dogmas and rules, there were gatherings, small intimate gatherings of people, very much like us today, although probably not quite as large as this, small gatherings of people that got together to kind of wrestle with, I imagine, this man's teachings and try to make them work in their lives in much the same way that I think you and I are invited today to try to apply the spiritual principles of oneness and love and kindness and compassion in difficult circumstances, in difficult circumstances. So I wanna share with you a few ideas on how we might conspire to live more from love. And the first is that I would say, let us conspire to speak from love, to speak from love. Let us listen to the words that we say that come out of our mouths, the tone of voice that we speak them with, and ask ourselves, am I speaking in a loving way? Do my words lift those around me up or shut them down? I respect very greatly a practice in Quakerism, which is basically the idea that you are to remain silent unless you can improve upon the silence. Wouldn't it be a very quiet world? <laughs> Don't you think? 
It would be really quiet if we held ourselves to, I'm going to remain silent unless I can improve upon the silence. We can use our words in conspiring to bring forth greater love by the words that we choose to speak. Let them be loving. Let us conspire to see through the eyes of love. In unity, we have a saying that we are to look for the Christ within. And we don't mean Jesus. We mean the state of consciousness that Jesus achieved in his life, lifetime. And that we are to look for the Christ within one another. And sometimes it's really easy and sometimes it's really challenging, isn't it? You know, when you're trying to get onto the freeway and nobody will let you in, those of you who ever leave the church property at five o'clock at night and try to come out this way when, when Clayton is used as, this is Clayton or activity, activity is used as almost a secondary route to Miramar Road, you can barely get out. Say, I'm going to see all of these drivers. Every single one, two, three, 10, 15, 20, 25, I counted them. <laughs> Through the eyes of love. What if I pictured that my beloved was the one that's driving and for whatever reason won't let me in? <laughs> what if I imagined that it was the Dalai Lama in the car? Would I have a different attitude? I think I might, I think I might. I shared this, some of you know that every morning I write a short little um, tweet. It was harder when it was only 140 characters. Now that I have more, it's a little easier. But a short little tweet called Just for Today and their spiritual practices. And I shared one, of, um, oh, last month, in which the practice was the idea of looking through the eyes of love and that when we are dealing with or find ourselves with really difficult people, people that we consider to be sandpaper to our soul, that one of the ways that we can conspire to see through the eyes of love is to imagine that person wearing an invisible sign and that that sign says, beneath what you see, I'm hurting. Please love me. Do any of you, and you don't have to raise your hand, do you, any of you have some people in your life that are really challenging for you? It might be a coworker, it could be a family member somebody that you know you're, you're not going to ever completely leave that person for maybe very complicated reasons, but every time you see them or you pick up the phone, there's just this energy, not your head. I think most of us in this room have somebody like that. What if we were to see through the eyes of love and imagine that they're, they're, they've got a sign that says, beneath what you see, I'm hurting, please love me. Or beneath what you see, I'm afraid, please love me. Beneath what you see, I feel ashamed or I feel alone, please love me. We would interact a little bit differently, wouldn't we? There would be a softening, I think. Another way that we can cons conspire to create a more loving world is to listen through the ears of love. How many times have we asked somebody, how are you doing? And what's the usual answer? Fine. And how often do we know that, no, they're probably not fine right now. They're going through something, I can hear it in their voice. You know what I'm talking about. To conspire to live from the decision to love means that we listen to one another, not just with our ears, but we listen with our very soul. We listen with our very heart. We listen for what's not being said, for the pain or the hurt or the separation or the confusion. Many of you know that I love uh, the writings of Rumi, and I'm particularly fond of this quote, there is a voice that doesn't use words. Listen. So much of what we try to communicate to one another, sometimes we have difficulty communicating it through our words. But if we will listen to one another with the ears of the heart, we will listen for what needs to be understood and we'll know how to respond. We can conspire to serve with a heart of love. You know, we can't do everything by a long shot to heal the world, let alone to heal some of the situations maybe immediately around us. But if we will make a decision to do what we can and to do it from a full heart, a heart of love, that's all that we are ever asked to do, spiritually, ethically, or in any other way. I think about this often. 
I think about how each one of us is in a particular set of relationships and circumstances in our lives. And each of us know different circles of people. And if we were to somehow be able to map out, as a result of everybody who's in the room tonight, if we could map out everyone that you know and that you interact with, that you, you Facebook with or you call or you visit with or as family or friends or coworkers, can you imagine the huge number of people that we would be thinking about right now? And what if we were to say, I am exactly where I need to be with exactly the right people in my life. May not be that I like everybody that's in my life or I understand everybody that's in my life, but I am exactly where I am to be able to influence this set of people by the way that I choose to love, by the way that I choose to serve, by the way that I choose to listen, by the way that I choose to show up. The Dalai Lama has said, love and compassion are necessities. Without them, humanity cannot survive. So we're talking about how do we let our light shine more brightly? And I really do believe it comes down to the very basic practice of loving in every direction and in every way possible. To walk in the way of love, to speak in the way of love, to listen in the way of love, to serve in the way of love, to give in the spirit of love. Do you believe that you have a unique offering and gift and way of being in the world? I believe that about you. I believe that you have a unique offering, a unique way of being, a unique something to give. And what I also believe with every fiber of my being is that the world needs you to be playing to your best self and by that I mean your most open, loving, spiritual self. And the world needs that of me as well. And if we do that, we will not only be letting our light shine so brightly, we will also be literally transforming our world in such a way that we don't leave anyone or anything out, that we bring everyone and everything right along with us. If Jesus was anything, I believe he was a teacher of consciousness, and a teacher of a way of living and being. It was very radical then, the way that he talked about God, the way that he talked about his relationship with God, the way that he said the things that I do, you shall do also, and greater things than these shall you do. But his, his message is every bit as applicable today. Let us not put him in a distant time and past, let's not put him on a pedestal but if we're here to celebrate and remember who he was, let us do it in such a way that we are followers. Not followers that are about a religion, but followers that are about a spiritual way of living that is all about letting our inner light shine. So I hope that you'll join me in this invitation and this challenge to enter into a conspiracy of love to let it be known that by the way we treat one another, which is a loving way of treating one another, that we are followers of this high, high consciousness. And with that, I say to you, a Merry Christmas. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the favorite, my favorite part of the service, and I hope yours as well, is that will take place in just a few moments as we get ready to, to prepare our candles. But before we do that, we're going to take a moment to prepare the, the gifts that we would like to share, the Christmas gifts we'd like to share with this community, with the Unity Center, that we might continue to do the work that is ours to do. Um, the gifts that you give throughout the year, the gifts that you send in electronically or in any other way, really are what makes what we do each and every Sunday and every day in between possible. And so we wanna say thank you in advance for the gifts that you share. And as you're preparing them, or if you already have them ready, I'd like to ask you just to hold them in your hand and to let your giving come this evening from a real place of joy and celebration. To let your giving come from a heart that is full 
to let your giving be done in such a way that you know that these tangible financial gifts are a way that we help to make possible a teaching and a practice that makes a difference in individual, in individual lives and also ripples out further and further. And so we give our gifts this evening in a commitment to and in a desire for transforming our world with love and doing so with great joy and great devotion. And so as we hold these gifts in our hands, we know that they are a symbol of the blessings that we have received. And we are eager and joyful in sharing them to make a difference in and through the work that this community does. Divine love flowing through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Together. Divine love flowing through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. And so it is. Amen. Thanks for listening. Sunday services at 9 and 11 a.m. Inclusivity. It's worth the drive. Subscribe to our podcasts and download our free app for instant access to a wealth of spiritual teachings, services, and events.